traditional thinking with autoimmune diseases is that this is a path that is destiny and is not one that can be controlled. The truth is you can take the body off of that path in a very significant way and keep it there, meaning you don't have to suffer from the disease. Hi everyone, Drew Brode here. Today's guest, Dr. Elroy Vajdani, one of the top experts in the space of autoimmune. And we're talking all things, what are the root causes of autoimmune? What foods both help it, but more importantly, what foods harm it? It's a fascinating conversation, stay tuned. I've been a big fan of your work. I've even sent people over to your clinic here in Los Angeles. So this is an incredible opportunity to really go to who I consider as one of the top autoimmune experts really that's out there and to have them on and really provide clarification on this debilitating disease that, you know, I, I was reading the stats in America, 50 million people alone just here suffering from diagnosed autoimmune conditions and millions more worldwide. So I want to jump right in and start with a big picture question mm -hmm. because you fundamentally look at all diseases, but specifically autoimmune through a different lens than the traditional medical infrastructure. So what important truth, I'm going to steal the Peter Thiel question. <laughs> and he says, you know, what important truth do you believe? And in this case, we're talking about autoimmune. So what important truth do you believe about autoimmune diseases that very few people out there agree with you on, but that you know is true? Traditional thinking with autoimmune diseases is that this is a path that is destiny and is not one that can be controlled. The truth is that if you detect this at an appropriate time and you figure out, more importantly, you figure out why the body has made this very significant error, you can take the body off of that path in a very significant way and keep it there, meaning you don't have to suffer from the disease. Now, you said an important word, error. Talk to us about autoimmune. How do we know it's an error? And how does the world of functional medicine, which you come from, mm -hmm. you're an MD, classically trained and everything, but you've gotten this additional training, both because your dad's an expert and a legend in this field, but mm -hmm. you've also gone through the training yourself. So, so how is autoimmune an error? And how does the world of functional medicine see that error and what causes it? Great question. So the error happens because we lose something called tolerance, right? Which is the most fundamental part of having an immune system. If we're going to have this intricate network of cells that communicate with each other, that are going to be here to defend us from foreign invaders, they have to first be able to identify self versus non-self. And we actually spend the first three years of our life looking at all of the different proteins, uh, bacteria, viruses in ourself and also that we're exposed to. And we make that distinction, self versus non-self. And under ideal circumstances, that first three years of programming stays for the rest of our life. Autoimmune disease is a loss of portions of that programming. So what we have designated itself as self, we lose. And the immune system now does not understand that it is our own tissue and it starts attacking. Now, the big question is always why? You know, if you look up, there's so many different autoimmune conditions that are out there. Hashimoto's, Graves disease, uh, you know, MS, all sorts of different ones that are there. They're all under this umbrella of autoimmune. And when you look them up or you check out the Wikipedia or the WebMD, mm -hmm. largely the answer is we don't know why this occurs. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about it. Why does this happen? Why is an error happening? Our body is so intelligent. So what is causing, especially over the history of humanity, that we're having an explosion with these conditions? The reason that Wikipedia doesn't have an answer for you is because for every individual with an autoimmune disease, there is a different set of whys, meaning that person's life to the point that the error happened is what resulted in the error happening. And you have to map out that personal journey to be able to understand their why. So when we look at why there's this explosion of autoimmune disease, you know, if you want to consider them all as a disease entity, um, being the predominant disease entity we're facing here in the United States, which is true, it's because so many things in those path, that the path of life for us are changing, right? Our food industry, has gone through dramatic change in the last 30, 40 years. 
we're exposed to more chemicals on a daily basis than we were before. Um, Martin Blazer, who is an incredibly brilliant scientist, discovered H. pylori, uh, has this key term also, which is the loss of our ancestral microbiome being a very big player. That means that as each generation passes for us in the last 100, 150 years because of the advent of antibiotics and the birth via cesarean section, we are losing chunks of our gut bacteria that should normally be passed on to us just like our genes are passed on to us. You put all those things together and you end up with an immune system that doesn't have the same kind of neutral input. It is set up for attack because it sees change and difference from what it was intended to see, let's say 200 years ago. It's almost in a way through the COVID pandemic, so many people who had never really even thought about an immune system were now all of a sudden thinking about an immune system. Mm -hmm. And especially if you were paying attention to health and wellness and looking for different things that you could do to support your immune system, a term that got thrown around a lot was you know, boosting your immune system. Mm -hmm. And in a way, we don't want our immune system so boosted because autoimmune is an example of that. We don't want it underactive. We don't want it overreactive. We want it right there in a neutral place. Correct. This is one of the big uh, misconceptions with the immune system, autoimmunity, and this general term inflammation that gets thrown around. Everything is an inflammatory disorder. The truth is that autoimmune disease comes in numerous flavors. You can have an inflamed, overactive immune system you can have an underactive immune system and still end up with autoimmunity. So uh, having anti-inflammatories on board really are dependent on the specific individual nature of that person's autoimmune disease. Not only are there different autoimmune conditions, but really what you're talking about here and what other individuals have shared on the podcast is that let's take, for instance, you know, Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. which primarily impacts women, but also some men too. It is... Um, this thyroid condition that's there, but every single person that has Hashimoto's, if you had a thousand patients with Hashimoto's, they all have their unique combination that led to that. Yeah. So while traditional medicine, well-intentioned, is looking for the one pill, and there's a place for prescription, right? Mm -hmm. Especially as you can see, anybody who's listening here that has something like Hashimoto's, you know, drugs are can be incredibly beneficial that's there. But I think what the lens is that you're bringing in is that it's not one thing that causes it, so it's not going to be one thing that fixes it. Absolutely. And it's also different per people. Can you tell me, let's just take a patient story, right? Is there an anecdote, a patient story of some of their unique things that led to their diagnosed autoimmune condition that you worked with? Anybody that comes to mind that you feel comfortable uh, sharing? Sure, absolutely. Um, uh so people tend to come to me in the clinic these days when they have done a lot of the traditional functional medicine work and are not getting anywhere, unfortunately. And let's happens. just list a couple of those things out. What would that look like? Um, autoimmune paleo diets, uh, gut support, you know, uh, glutamine, probiotics. So the basics. The basics, right? right? Which are very significant interventions. And do work for some people. I would say the majority of people. Yeah. They'll definitely work for them. And, and, and let's take Hashimoto's as an example. The majority of people with Hashimoto's will do very well if that's what they start with um, and you know that they'll, they'll continue to do well if they continue to execute it but there are people who have different versions of that same autoimmune disease that have different environmental triggers so uh, there are several cases that came to me that were Hashi's autoimmune paleo diet for a year and a half which is an incredibly restrictive diet and difficult to execute and TPOs just climbing and you know need more and more thyroid replacement and everyone's saying what in the world is going on I don't know how to get a grasp of this. And it turns out that they would have some type of chronic viral reactivation that's going on for them. Um, Epstein-Barr virus is the classic one for Hashimoto's that we talk about, but it can be other viruses as well. And when you start to look at specifically where is their immune system failing in the ability to control this virus and then fix that part, then the autoimmune disease starts going in the right direction. So I had a, a patient with exactly that story autoimmune paleo, gut support to the max, a year and a half. Other practitioner didn't know what to do with them anymore. Um, we did a chronic viral panel, showed uh, Epstein-Barr virus in its reactivated form. Uh, I'll give a shout out to my dad uh, at Immunosciences doing that panel. I think he does it better than anyone else. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I looked at the specifics of that individual's immune system, gave them some very directed antiviral support to the immune system to fix the imbalance. TPO started falling and, and that patient has been in remission and actually pulled off of thyroid medication. Incredible. So, you know, you listed out some of these buckets. We talked about environmental toxins. We talked about vir viruses. You mentioned microbiome and and food there might be some other ones that are that are inside of there mm -hmm. but let's start with food because that's always a big question and it was one of the first things you mentioned in terms of the soup the complex soup yeah. that has created the right conditions for an explosion of autoimmune yeah so talk to us big picture about food you know you have a book coming out in september yeah and it's called when food bites back mm -hmm. so Tell us a little about food and how is it that it's now, we're not just, you know, for, for, for hundreds of years, humanity primarily dealt with, are people getting enough food? Yeah. We were dealing with famine. We yeah. still are a little bit, but now, you know, more people die of obesity than, than die from, from famine worldwide. It's, it's, you know, famine is still horrific. It's, it's challenging. And it, it's, it's primarily been that we went from, is there enough food for everybody to now we're really asking ourselves, what food should people be eating? So how is food and autoimmune connected? connected? Yeah. So uh, incredible point and such a, a really important foundation for us to have this conversation about autoimmune disease. Food is absolutely shifting the table on us and is starting to hurt us instead of help us anymore, which is why, you know, these diets are becoming so common. The reason for that is twofold, in my opinion. Number one is the biggest driver of the tone of the immune system is the environment of the gut. Now, the environment of the gut is a big thing. You know, it includes what kind of bacteria are in there, what's the state of the lining, what's the state of the mucosal immune system. But that, that internal environment is probably the most important thing for our health in general and also specifically autoimmune disease. And uh, when there are errors in that environment, that's a ripe mechanism for a loss of tolerance. Loss of tolerance always occurs in relationship to proteins. The immune system recognizes proteins. Antibodies are directed at portions of proteins called peptides. So if there is an influx of a protein or peptide to a imbalanced microenvironment, that will set somebody up for autoimmunity because that protein itself will be the thing that the immune system sees as potentially problematic when the internal environment is broken, okay? To get to that broken place, we've done lots of things to ourselves, right? We have changed the nature of some of the staple grains that we consume. We have changed the nature of the way that we grow and consume protein, animal protein. Um, by that, I mean the actual protein compositions in these foods themselves today are different than they were a hundred years ago because of the industrial food revolution. Um, and then we use tremendous amounts of pesticides with some of those grains that further creates a set of signals to the immune system that something's not right. We use antibiotics tremendously and there's some good to that, but I feel like we've stepped into the realm of using them too much. Those antibiotics also change the internal microenvironment. And I think our lifestyle these days is that other thing. You know, we, we work a lot. We're stressed as Americans. I think we carry a lot of emotional stress. We tend to maybe drink a little bit more than we should. And you put all of those things together in the big pot and you get an unhappy internal environment that wants to figure out why it's unhappy. And it only knows how to recognize proteins. So the protein that it sees the most often that's tagged with maybe a pesticide is the one it's going to choose as the target. Wheat being the primary example, gluten being the primary food that we try to eliminate. And whatever is the similar protein to that in the body is going to be the one that we unintentionally attack because they look alike, right? That's molecular mimicry in a nutshell. So, which is one of the, you know, just zooming out mm -hmm. molecular mimicry is one of the pathways to creating, um, 
the conditions for autoimmune disease to flourish. Yeah, probably the most important one when it comes to gut health itself, right? So we're basically talking about there's a border in your body and many people have heard us do episodes and other people do episodes about a term leaky gut mm -hmm. or intestinal permeability, but actually it'd be good to just revisit it and sort of describe it, you know, using some kind of analogy so that people can picture this, this, um, this sort of border inside the body. Absolutely. So one of the most fundamental concepts in functional personalized medicine, autoimmune disease is the state of what's happening at the lining of the small intestine, right? Under normal circumstances, we have in, I would say a wall with a peephole in it where the immune system sitting on the inside of that wall can open up the hole, take a peek at what's on the other side and say, do I like that or not like that? Do I open the door and let these guys in or do I keep it closed and I'm sorry, you can't come in right now? Exactly. And that, that door is zonulin, right? So uh, that's a protein that basically allows this otherwise concrete wall to have an opening in it so that the immune system can send some scouts to the other side to say, hey, what's here? The scouts then run back in through that door, tell all the other parts of the immune system, hey, you'll never believe what I saw, right? I saw gluten with some Roundup attached to it. Right. right. Or I saw that, you know, I mean, think about a border between like US and Canada. If right. we were at, you know, if there was a hostile environment, all of a sudden with our neighbors, we got into a fight. You'll never believe what they're putting on their French fries over there, right? Right. You know, and come back and tell everybody what the state of the other side is. And and really this wall, for people to understand how significant it is, it's really the first time that the outside world is meeting the inside world. Absolutely. Right? Because as you chew food, as you swallow it, it goes through your stomach, your digestive acids. It goes through your large intestines into the small intestines that are there. It's that's still the body kind of considers that the outside world. It is the outside without question, right? I mean, it's mixed with stomach acid and bacteria and a bunch of other things. But when you put things in your mouth and chew it, you are putting the outside world into your inside, right? And it's the job of that wall and the immune system on the other side of it to say, hey, what part of this do we want? What part of this do we not want? And it, it's actually leaky gut intestinal permeability is a breakdown both in the wall and on the with the immune system on the other side of it. So the door is now in an open position. Anything can come in and out. It's not just open for a brief amount of time, see what's there and run back. The Things gates can... of the castle are broken. Exactly. They can't distinguish who's friendly and who's foe. Exactly. And now foe starts to come in. Exactly. And, and then the fundamental actual issue there is what the immune system sees on the other end and the signaling that it sends to the rest of the body. That is where autoimmunity actually takes place, right? This can go on for a couple of days and the immune system can handle it, right? We have 60% of our immune system on the other end of this for a reason. Something goes on, we need to be able to have a secondary wall, a secondary defense. If it goes on for months or years, and you don't know about it because most people with intestinal permeability are asymptomatic or they don't know that they're symptomatic, then all of a sudden the immune system says, hey, what's going on here? Like, this is not something I was intended to deal with for months. I am running out of recruits. I can't keep making these guys. And then it says, sends out signals to the rest of the body, the systemic immune system and says, you've got to help me here. Something is happening, right? Yeah. And it's where that, where that next step occurs where that systemic immune system says, okay, we're having an issue here. We're sending everything we can to the other side of that wall and we're going to try to eradicate them. And that's where you start producing antibodies to proteins. And, and, and this may sound crazy to people, but as is the micro, so is the macro. You know, when we were in the United States at, at, at war with, you know, Japan, mm -hmm. we had, what do we have when we couldn't understand where the enemy was coming from, quote unquote. Yep. We created internment camps, which was a really terrible thing. And mm -hmm. we said, hey, everybody who's Asian, I mean, even if people weren't Japanese, mm -hmm. they're being tossed. I mean, the whole thing was a bad idea to begin with, but I'm just giving an example. Yep. Or in my case, you know, I'm from India and I'm South Asian and I'm brown, mm -hmm. but you know, a lot of people would look at me, they wouldn't know where I was from after September 11th. Yeah. You saw, okay, you go through airport security, everybody's being flagged because the entire country feels that it's at threat. Right. Again, not justifying it, not saying anything about that, but as we see in the macro, this is what's happening in the body. It's overwhelmed, mm -hmm. something is happening. So really the question is, 
what are some of the biggest culprits that are leading specifically in this category of food because other aspects can damage this wall too. Mm -hmm. Other things can damage the body and we'll get into those other classifications. But what is it on the food side, top culprits that are causing a lot of this damage that it's not just guessing you guys can actually, and you test for this on a, on a pretty regular basis. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, no surprise for those of us that are seasoned in the functional and personalized medicine world, gluten is the number one culprit. Uh, there's several reasons for that. Uh, you know, likely it has a lot to do with, again, the combination of the protein molecule itself with a pesticide commonly attached to it, which is Roundup, um, along with the large nature of this protein. It's a very, very big food protein that doesn't get fully broken down by the time it gets to the small intestine. So it's more prone to be attacked because we're used to seeing very small portions of it, not large portions of it. Um, and it also has a, a lot of protein sequences that look similar to other parts of our body. So for example, thyroid tissue, uh, brain tissue, um, I, I'd say you know, the, the central nervous system and, and the thyroid are the two biggest places where gluten reactivity seems to occur, but it can cross react with our cell membranes. So all the cells in your body can be attacked. That would happen in phospholipid syndrome. Um, you know, it really is pretty ubiquitous. It looks very similar to synovial and joint tissue. So you can attack your joints. Uh, there, there are many parts of the body that are attacked by gluten. And then you move on down to what are the other common things that we consume in modern America and it's processed grains outside of, let's say, even wheat. So those tend to be the next on the list. So corn you know, would be next up again, you know, something that has been modified by the food industry a great deal in the last 30, 40 years. So maybe our immune system isn't programmed to see it in its current state and it tends to carry a lot of pesticides. Soy is another example of something like that as well. So, you know, people hear this and especially if they're new and I appreciate all the new listeners that are coming to the podcast and there's a sense of, wait, so you're saying wheat, this ancient food that we've been eating for so many thousands of years or corn, you know, this vegetable that has, you know, some cases, you know, so, so many beneficial properties or soy that certain regions have been having. What all of a sudden has happened that these now are causing an issue because are you sure? Because humanity has been eating them for a while. Maybe not long, as long as people think. They're actually still pretty relatively new. Correct. But what has happened with these items? Because you're not, you haven't actually been eating these foods for a long time, right? You, you're thinking of ancient, and by ancient, I'll say 200 years old versions of these grains, which were similar to the ones that we consumed, let's say a thousand years ago. Uh, but those are not what you're consuming today, right? Like, uh, my family is from the Middle East, right? The wheat that we would have consumed has nothing to do with the wheat that we consume here in the United States. Their proteins are not similar. Uh, same with corn, right? The corn that we consume here in the US and in other Western parts of the world is nothing like the traditionally grown natural agriculture product in let's say Latin America or in East Africa. They're, they're not similar to each other at all. You're not consuming what people consumed a couple hundred years ago. And that's such an important point because I was watching a documentary and I saw that actually sourdough bread, which was some of the first levitated bread, yep. originated from, you know, Iran and that region. Yep. And um, they were, it was a completely different process. It's totally. And molecularly, those, that wheat, that, that's part of the process actually looks, looks different. So there's modern wheat and there's native wheat. Right. And actually you and some of your colleagues were, have, I, I don't know, I believe you were involved in this. We had Dr. Karazian on the podcast and he was talking about how he actually has looked at the impact of native wheat versus more modernized. I don't know if it's the appropriate term is hybridized. I'm mm -hmm. not sort of well versed in that category and how they actually have a different response in the body. Yeah. That's my father's research. So uh, he's actually the one who did those studies can you talk uh, about and, them and for a second? Came out with that idea. Absolutely. You know, like it, it, it's anecdotally we'll hear in the clinic that, you know, originally people will say, I lived in Germany for 30 years of my life. I moved here to LA and then all hell broke loose and we do testing for them and they have tremendous non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We pull them off of gluten here. They do great. They'll come back to me and they'll say, Dr. V, I'm going home to see my parents. I can't not have 
this local bread product around the corner from my parents' house. I have to have it. Can I have it? And I'll say, well, we'll find something out about your body by you having it. So go have it. Let's go run that experiment. There's no blood test that tells me more information than what is about to happen when you go home and have that bread, right? In your home environment with a different set of emotional circumstances and a different, likely very different grain than the one you were consuming here. And nine times out of 10, they'll be absolutely fine. Um, and, you know, then they'll come back to LA and they'll say, what the hell? You know, like, how do I explain this to them, right? And it's like, well, you weren't consuming the same grain and you were in a different set of circumstances. So that holds very true, I think, for people between Europe and the US. And, and the question that always came to us scientifically, you know, I'll take my white coat off in the clinic and then go into the lab with my dad and we'll say, what makes up for what makes those differences, right? It has to be protein composition. So we'll pull an ancient wheat product like einkorn and we'll pull a modern commercial wheat product from the US. We will extract the pre peptides, both water and alcohol soluble peptides are present in those products. And then we'll take a person's blood who has reacted to the North American version and see if they react to, let's say, an ancient Middle Eastern version. And there are dramatic differences and it makes absolute sense. They're the peptides and proteins are different. They are not the same product. They are given the same name globally, but they are not the same product. It's so fascinating. And you know, you and I both live here in Los Angeles and we're actually fortunate. Um, and I know you have a little bit of a history. I want to talk about that with, you know, gluten and a few other products of, mm -hmm. of how you kind of came into this space. But we're very fortunate in, in Los Angeles that there are places that are starting to recognize this and out of both tradition, but also a little bit of health, they are importing n native wheat strains. Mm -hmm. You know, you have places like, uh, you know, even Italy, which is pretty commercial, yep. saying, hey, we pride ourselves on bringing in um, grain from Italy, Italy. for yeah. our pizzas and other stuff. And I always tell my friends who come to visit in town and they're like, oh man, I'd love to grab some pizza, but I know you don't really eat like a lot of gluten. I'm like, look, we can actually go over to Italy. Yep or some other place and I have no affiliation with them. There's a bunch of other places that are there too. And I notice a difference, mm -hmm. you know, the a few times that I've had wheat products that, cause I am very sensitive and we'll talk about sensitivities and that, you know, I'm not celiac diagnosed, but I'm very sensitive. And when I have wheat, even organic wheat that is grown here in the United States, I feel foggy. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have a brick in my stomach. Mm -hmm. My digestion slows down. I get actually redness on my skin a little bit. I have all these things and people for years would tell me it's in your head, you know, you know, don't, don't, you're overthinking it, you know, and so many people listening today, they've been through that before, right? And then I can go and have it somewhere else. Not that it's a regular staple of my diet, but I could have a pizza every so often and I don't feel that same yeah. response that's there. Do you notice that yourself? I don't. Unfortunately, I'm on I'm on the extreme end of that. Maybe one out of ten people with non celiac gluten sensitivity. That even if I touch that stuff, let's talk about Italy. that. Where where did that start for you? Right, you were in uh, university, right? Yeah, I was in college uh, at Berkeley, and you know I was having a very unusual set of clinical circumstances. And so I, I would call my dad and just be like, Dad, I don't know what's going on, but every single month I'm getting a sinus infection, right? like literally clockwork. And I would go to the health center and they would give me a Z pack and, you know, it would go away eventually. Who knows if the Z pack was doing anything really in reality there. But I think for a solid like year, year and a half, like I was literally sinus infection, sinus infection. And, and at the same time, didn't feel cognitively like myself. Like I was losing some sharpness and obviously, you know, college is college. So there's some reasons, you know, maybe too much partying or whatever that you would attribute that to, but it just still seemed off. It, this was 20 years ago, right? So my dad was actually at the time developing food sensitivity testing, uh, specifically to gluten and casein, which he suspected with that, you know, uh, very elaborate mind of his were culprits in this space. And, you know, he said, next time you're home, why don't you give me a, a sample of blood and and I'll run an experiment for you. And uh, for growing up in the Vojdani household, that's a very common thing to happen. <laughs> I know that might sound very weird, but he took samples of my blood, ran tests all the time, uh, you know, to kind of help him figure out what's going on with his own testing. 
And he called me, I went back to school on, on that Monday and he called me and said, you know, I don't know what to tell you, but you have really severe reactions to both gluten and dairy. And, you know, I was, would have a whole milk latte on the way to, you know, class every single morning. I was consuming tons of gluten and dairy at that time. He said, you know, um, why don't you pull it out of your diet for four weeks? And was, you know, I thought about it for a while and it's like, that sounds pretty difficult. Um, like many people go through these days, this was 20 years ago, right? So the concept of this even existing, he was really the only voice in the room. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Fasano was also really at the very original stages of doing his research with Harvard, finding out the connection between gluten and zonulin. So th there's nobody vocally saying this out there, right? So I hear that and I say, okay, I'm gonna start with one of them. I'll take the dairy out, right? Took the dairy out and the sinus infections gone. Never again. I have not had one since then. Okay. If I rechallenge any type of dairy product, whether it's, you know, homogenized, non homogenized, raw, whatever it is goats, sheep, goat, all sheep, of it. my sinuses go immediately. Right. And, uh, I have this thing, you know, where at restaurants, if, you know, I'll tell them, hey, listen, I don't eat gluten or dairy. Can you please help me out by making sure that there isn't any in the dish? You know, often it's a restaurant. Oftentimes they're busy. You know, sometimes mistakes are made. I'll have a spoon of something that has a little bit of dairy in it and my sinuses will go. Like I, I will feel it immediately. Your and, nose will start running. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get pressure. Nose will start running and I get an immediate reaction. Right. So unfortunately, my body hasn't let me back into the dairy world. So, so this is a great... Uh, thank you for sharing that in yeah. your journey. Yeah. Right? And I also love, you see the most passionate researchers, physicians in this space that are the most open-minded, they have often gone through their own suffering. Oh, yeah. Right? And and that's a, a great thing to look for in a, in a doctor um, is somebody who's, who's, not that they have to exactly have gone through what you've gone through, but at least they've been a, on the other end of it. Mm -hmm. And they can understand that even though they went to med school, even though they went to this, that, there were some things that were unexplained and they were searching for answers, yep. right? That's really a lot of how so many physicians found themselves to the integrative and functional medicine you know, space that's there. And so thank you for sharing that. Now, as a contrast, what would explain, right? Just high level, right? Obviously you haven't done my full you know, workup and everything like that. Yeah. But what would explain how, for me, also, 20 years ago, I turned 40 next year, and it was it was 22 years ago that I first heard. I was at a uh, lecture here in LA mm -hmm. for a gathering of people in this tradition called the Jain tradition. Mm -hmm. um, it's a religion and way of life from India, and my mom comes from that background. Yep. And I came to uh, meditation, youth sort of programming, and I saw a speaker there for the first time. It was the first time that I heard somebody say, that dairy, she was doing it more from a vegan perspective. Yeah. You know, she was trying to convince these young children who were mostly all vegetarian to abandon milk because of its cruelty in, in the marketplace. And, you know, they're like, milk is the only thing that we can have. We're vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Like, what? No Taco Bell? No, you know, yeah. this, that. And she was like, well, you know, for a lot of you who are suffering with acne, milk could be supporting inflammation in the body. It's the first time I even heard the word inflammation. Yeah. Right. I had nobody, I'd, I'd never heard any of that. Yeah. And she didn't even explain it more than that. It was just like, you know, milk is linked to causing acne in the body. And there's something that people are talking about right now called inflammation. Yeah. I had really bad acne at yeah. the time. I was horrific. I dreaded, you know, taking photos and other things like that. And it just was, it, it really set the tone for my entire high school experience that no matter how popular I was or how many friends I had, other stuff, it was always in the background of my head. I was sure. like, man, when am I going to be able to get this under control? Sure. So I was willing to do anything. If somebody said, you know, some random thing that you shouldn't do would help, I would say, okay, let me at least try it. So I got off of dairy and within two months, immediately, mm -hmm. my acne started going away. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I learned about, you know, gluten and other things like that. But what explains maybe some of the differences or what could explain some of the differences between somebody like yourself who you can't even touch gluten and somebody like myself where I don't have wheat on a regular basis, mm -hmm. but I'm going to Italy soon. I can partake a little bit over there with yeah. me, me and my fiance. Yeah. I can have a little bit of goat's milk and sheep's milk and other stuff. But if I have it every day, 
two meals in a row for like three or four days, all of a sudden now I have cold-like symptoms. So what would explain the differences between me and you and what's going on inside of the body? It all has to do with the, the tone of your immune system in that scenario, right? By tone, I mean how much of each arm of the immune system do you have? Some of that is dictated by the innumerable number of things that you have experienced from an environmental perspective in your life to that point. And some of it is actually genetic, right? So um, I have a more aggressive immune tone that does not want to let go of seeing something inflammatory, even if it's been a 20 year break, it doesn't want to let go of that thought that it continues to create significant inflammation. So my, my immune tone is more geared towards a TH1 subtype, right? That's a specific subtype of CD4 cells, which are a very important type of T cell. Um, so that makes me in the unfortunate group that can't reintroduce something inflammatory once it's been identified as inflammatory because I have such a strong tone of remembering that, right? It's your body's own experience of dealing with both genetic influences, which could also include, you know, traumas mm -hmm. that could be there absolutely right both yeah. physical or like anything else like that like the history like the whole history that goes into it but is there a silver lining does that mean that your body's capable of dealing with i don't know pathogens in a better way like is there any benefit that you get from that that oh. your body i i think that it's absolutely a, if you can pay attention and identify this about yourself it's a gift right it, it's your body having an early warning sign against something inflammatory, whether it's a food or a toxin or a bacteria or a virus. And to answer the, the specific question, yes, my body does incredibly well with viral infections. Um, you know, I, I, through medical school residency fellowship, experienced many of them mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, you know, always did incredibly well with whatever my body would throw. So I, I have this tone that is set in this inflammatory way, which doesn't serve me well if I'm going to eat something or consume something that's inflammatory regularly. But if there's a every once in a while inflammatory challenge like a virus, great. Clear it right away. And I think that's an important reminder because so many people who are suffering in this conversation, we're talking about autoimmune. Um, but this goes for a lot of different diseases that are out there. So many people who are suffering and if they've been through the journey and they've tried maybe light level stuff of removing gluten and dairy and other things for a period of time and maybe even gotten a little bit better. Um, but then they go back to their old way of life mm -hmm. and they think, man, why have I been cursed? Why has the universe, God, whatever, my genetics, the history. But we have to remember that there's, yes, there's challenges with it, but there's also potentially upsides that could be there. And, yeah. and it's an important mindset piece that I think is there because people who have been suffering from autoimmune for such a long period of time, it's easy to start to feel like you want to give up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it is, as I mentioned, in many ways a gift because you're going to be given the ability to have impact on your health future. Yes, having autoimmune disease is unfortunate. You don't want you know, to end up in that situation if you have something to say about it. But for many people, they discover it when they haven't had an opportunity to do something about it because the knowledge to do something isn't there. But no matter where that knowledge inserts itself in your life, it is giving you the ability to take whatever road you were traveling, remove yourself from that road and create a new one. And in the world of health, to not just be a passenger, but to actually be able to change the path of the road traveled is incredibly powerful. It gives you internal strength. You're not, you know, just going to a doctor's office and saying, okay, what's my medication? All right, when it doesn't work anymore in three years, what's my next medication? And just kind of sit back and wait. You are an empowered individual who then has the ability to say, no, my health is going this direction. You know, in this world of uh, political correctness that we're in sort of right now, this is often seen as a blasphemous statement, but I want to remind everybody, and this is a reminder myself too, we are part of the problem. Yeah. We are part of the problem, and that's a good thing because if we are part of the problem, doesn't mean that we were the cause of it, but if we're part of the problem and we have influence over it, that means that we can do something about it. Yeah. If this is just something that fell into our lap, 
that we have to deal with forever that often is the diagnosis that a lot of people get. This is just something that you're going to have to manage yeah. through expensive treatments and drugs and other things like that. And maybe one day we'll throw a Hail Mary pass and we'll have a cure, mm. right? But that takes away responsibility from you. And that's not from a you know, ethical standpoint. It's actually from an empowerment standpoint. When you lose the responsibility in any aspect of life, including health, you also lose the power to shift it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to be able to say, I, I, some of this was the way my life was lived. Maybe I didn't have the tools to know any better, but I have those tools now and I'm going to do something about it now. And when you experience the difference, to me, there's nothing more powerful in the world. You know, a big part of functional medicine is taking a proper intake and history of a patient's entire life. Yeah. Because what they went through, how they were born, the experiences that they had, trauma, bad breakups, you know, the st- Pulling all nighters in med school, all these things influence yeah. the makeup of our immunotype, which we're going to get to in a second. This is an important part of the conversation, and this is work that you and your your dad have, you know, been really sort of leading the efforts on. But tell me, in your instance, because you were so open with your story and journey, what were some of the other factors that you think created the unique circumstances that you have, where foods that I might be able to tolerate a little bit, or some other people might be able to tolerate a lot, might be things that are so much more reactive inside of your system. Just what have you found in your own journey if you would flip the lens back on you? Of course. So um, I'm one of three kids. Both of my parents are doctors. My dad is a PhD in immunology. My mom is a PsyD in in psychology. Uh, Both worked full time my entire life, right? So what that meant was oftentimes when we made it home, there wasn't enough energy space to go for that home cooked meal, right? So believe it or not, being the son of two doctors, oftentimes it was an afternoon journey to Burger King, Pizza Hut, or whatever fast food was available. And, you know, I don't blame my parents. They didn't have another choice. Right? I mean, they, you know, fought tooth and nail to come to this country. Oh, and in time. their eyes, they're thinking they're just trying to do what's right for you so they can pay for the right school and get you education and put a roof over your guys' head. I think they made the most logical decision with what was in front of them at the time, right? Even my dad being who he is, didn't have the knowledge at the time that that was happening to know that this was maybe the wrong thing. Uh, So I had a lot of fast food growing up. I had a lot of pizza. I had a lot of processed grain. I had a lot of processed dairy product. Um, You know, I think, again, being the next generation from a family of immigrants brought about its own stresses as well. You know, being different in, you know, society, not, you know, uh, I think being able to relate to everything that was going on to every you know with everybody in my class you know you the get, lunches they brought were different you know, everything was different right there was some did, stress there did you go through any bullying or anything like that yeah yeah, yeah. And, and actually the majority of the bullying came from the middle eastern kids <laughs> at school who would call me wonder bread because i had a lot of friends friends who were caucasian and, and were local here so uh, I got Wonder Bread bullied. Yeah, you weren't um, Middle Eastern enough. No, I wasn't Middle East. I didn't. In I didn't, their eyes, I didn't exclusively hang out with Middle Eastern people. Which yeah, was, which is a, if anybody's not from LA, you know, that's like a thing. You, you know, know, we have the they, largest sort of Persian population, and you know, as any group, you know, yes. say, and as any group, it's not just unique to that. Clicks and other things like that, Big but time. an important piece because even going through those stressors as a kid, on top of a processed food diet, other things like. That has an impact on your it, health. It does. And uh, I have very, very vivid memories of when I was younger, also having a bottle of bubblegum amoxicillin in the refrigerator. And, you know, whenever we had anything, you know, like a little runny nose or whatever was going on, we would get a spoon of bubblegum amoxicillin. And as a kid, you know, you loved it because it tastes great. But looking back at that, that was a lot of antibiotic exposure. Um, and, and, you know, getting outside of the physical realm, I think there's also something to be said about generational trauma. You know, I think that that when again, when you're the generation that comes from immigrant parents who have gone through an incredible amount of trauma, which both of my parents did, um, there's something passed on there. I don't, you know, we, we talk a lot about how our genetics may be modified by trauma, um, but you know, I think that probably there is some physical change to other parts of our body, like the immune system, that are maybe inherited from generational trauma. So I think all those things put together and and it was right for me having a really inflammatory immune response. But the universe looked out for me in another way. It gave me my dad who had the ability to identify that there was something wrong and gave me the tools to be able to help myself forward. You know, 
Thank you for sharing that. And I think a lot of people can relate with their own version. Even if you're not an immigrant, you know, wherever you live in the world, everybody has their own trials and tribulations they went through, Mm -hmm. that their parents went through, that their grandparents went through. Everybody's had their own unique adaptation to modern life. Now, the really, you know, there's a bunch of takeaways from your story, but one important takeaway here is that you actually weren't diagnosed with a full-blown autoimmune condition, if Mm -hmm. I understand that correctly, right? That's correct. You, luckily, fortunately enough, between the influence of your father, who again is a major leader in this space and field and has developed a lot of the testing that so many clinicians use to catch autoimmune conditions early, in a way, that's exactly what happened. If you didn't intervene, if your father didn't intervene, maybe five, 10, 15, 20, we don't know exactly, you could have ended up with a full-blown autoimmune condition, but you got involved early enough and changes were made that you didn't steer in that direction. True. That's the most important sentence, I think, of everything we've said so far. And it, it, to me, honestly, something that I reflect on all of the time. There are an infinite number of people out there who didn't have the fortunate circumstances of having a father who was involved in the field early or plenty of people out there who don't have the fortunate circumstances of being able to access a functional medicine physician who knows what they're doing in this space and can gather the data for them at a point where they can intervene early enough to change their course. So um, I think about that all the time. There are th- th- this this whole exponential rise in autoimmune disease, probably also going to be perpetuated by what happened with COVID here, um, you know, it is unfortunately going to mean a lot of suffering in the future if we don't get an ability to give these tools to everybody as quickly as possible. And part of this is like also explaining languaging because most people, when it comes to autoimmune, they wait um, because they don't really, they don't know what other options they have. You show up one day to the doctor's office, you've been having certain particular symptoms depending on what the autoimmune condition is that you're dealing with. And you're like, this has been going on or my, I have hair loss and I have anxiety and I have this. And the doctor comes back and says, oh, we should, you know, test you and screen for Hashimoto's or somebody else starts to develop, you know, um, issues with their nervous system or, or, or mobility yep. or, their, or their joints hurt. And then they say, okay, we need to look at arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, or we need to look at MS and we wait till things are really bad. Now, a big part of your work and your father's work is look. Let's help people who are diagnosed, for sure. We want to help people who have autoimmune, but even if you're listening and you don't have an autoimmune disease yet, you want to start thinking in the direction of, do you have pre or pre-pre-autoimmune? Yep. So help explain what those might be, and I'm not even sure if that's the language that you use, but it's the concept. Yeah, so autoimmune disease, like many chronic diseases, take any number of years to decades to develop from the time the error in the immune system occurs, right? And there are three stages of quote unquote autoimmunity. Stage one would be the error occurring and you're starting to develop the antibodies in your blood to your own tissue. Stage two is those antibodies are actually binding to the tissue, which is an important kind of progression in that space and causing some type of inflammatory damage, but the the tissue itself is not irreversibly damaged yet. And stage three is where the vast majority of people get diagnosed. That's where the antibodies have been present for, let's say, three to 15 years. It's been binding to tissue, causing inflammation, those vague symptoms of brain fog, joint pain, digestive issues, hair loss have been going on. No one's been able to pinpoint what's happening. And then boom, oh, guess what? You have RA, right? And at that point, you know, you can still do something about it, but it's not the ideal point to intervene. So, um, Actually, the, 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 this idea came about in a very big paper, I think published in Science or Nature in 2014, was the idea of how do we pick up people in stage one or even stage two? That's far better than picking them up in stage three. And we have autoimmune antibodies mapped out for virtually every autoimmune disease that we know of so far. So why don't we create screening tests or tools to be able to screen for at least the most common ones that people suffer from? And then if you find them, then you've got to do the work to say, why are these forming? How do I stop them from forming? What can I do to help that person? And, and that's where the personalized functional medicine algorithm and, and kind of way of thinking really helps. But you start with, does the person have autoimmune antibodies circulating in their bloodstream? Are they stage one or stage two? From there, 
all of us as physicians and all the practitioners that are out there need to put on the Sherlock Holmes hat and dig down and say, my job is to now figure out why. Why are these antibodies developing and what can I do about it? And granted, this is not something we learn in medical school. Um, but that's okay. We still have the ability in the rest of our lives to learn something that we didn't learn in medical school and actually continue to help people and progress as a practitioner or physician. Um, so the next step there is to say, okay, let me get an idea of what's happening with this person's immune system. I know these antibodies are present and they're problematic for autoimmune disease, but what is actually happening with the immune system itself? And that's where immunotyping comes in. Immunotyping gives you the ability to say specifically, is there a problem with B cells? Is the problem with T cells? If the problem is with T cells, where is the problem happening? Is it too much of this? Not enough of that? Uh, where's the imbalance? Th1, Th2. And from there, you get a tremendous look at what the potential road to that place might have been and your Sherlock Holmes ability becomes easier. And immunotyping, which is this idea that, is it led by primarily your father? He is the brainchild of that, like many things in the past, and all, <laughs> all hats off to him. He's, uh, I think, 76 this year and continues to be as prodigious as he ever has been. No, he's a great guy. I've had the fortunate, to, fortunate opportunity to meet him at conferences and other stuff and trade emails, and he's an incredible soul and, and really so much of... Uh, what's known out there in this space of how functional medicine treats autoimmune conditions and other things is really built on top of the work and the research that he's done. So hats off to you and your family for all that, especially your dad. So immunotyping, which your dad has really been the proponent of in classification, just so everybody can follow along, it's this idea and concept of almost archetypes, archetypes for the immune system. Yeah. And if you understand what archetype somebody is, then you can look at what are the unique circumstances and factors going back to your earlier buckets that could be linked to that. Because right. before you may see antibodies that are elevated inside, inside, inside of the body and you, you could find some evidence of, of um, you know, maybe this person is dealing with this or maybe this person is dealing with that. But immunotyping is zeroing in a lot more specifically. So you could see, you know, does this person have chronic infections as being a primary driver? Right. Is it viral you know, disease that they're dealing with? Is it environmental toxins, for example? So, so let's take one that is a, one that we've done a uh, podcast before with um, actually a really incredible dentist based here in uh, Los Angeles. I don't know if you know her. She's also Iranian, Dr. Rosita Rashtian. No, I don't know her. I got to introduce you guys because she's a biological and functional medicine dentist. Awesome. Um, functional dentist. There's not a functional medicine dentist, but she's a functional dentist. And she's been somebody that's been sounding the alarm around mercury mm -hmm. and does a lot of procedures here locally that people fly in for and come and see her to properly have mercury extracted from their some their their you know mouth yep. and their amalgam fillings. So let's take an example like, you know, uh, uh, a toxin like mercury, right? How, how would, if you're looking at somebody through the immunotyping lens and they've been somebody who's dealt with heavy mercury exposure through cracked fillings and other things like that, how would that influence potentially or be one of the things that influences their immunotyping that they're dealing with? It can happen in a few ways, actually, but environmental toxins, metal specifically, let's say mercury or aluminum specifically, we'll talk about mercury, uh, can cause influence by either being present within cells and creating direct toxicity to the cell itself or by binding to your own tissue and creating a new protein target for the immune system and those will look different on immunotyping so if the mercury is present within cells intracellularly and is reducing the ability of the cell to replicate and produce and do what it's normally going to do you're going to see some suppression of the immune system, particularly uh, you can see Th1 suppressions or B cell suppressions. And then if, if it's actually a situation where the mercury is binding to your own tissue, which is one of the known environmental mechanisms of autoimmunity itself, you're going to see an increase in Th1 because the body is identifying that there is a new protein target and perpetuating that inflammatory response to the point of generating autoimmune disease. So this could be an example. So 
connecting those dots to a full blown sort of autoimmune condition. Yep. This is why somebody like Dr. Terry Walls, who we've had on the podcast and is does a lot of work in MS, but other autoimmune conditions too. This is why somebody like her would say that one of the things that she might have the doctors that are trained in her protocol look at is somebody's environmental exposure because is their own body attacking their joints and other, you know, central nervous system because there could be mercury lodged inside of them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you need to know the immunotypes that lean towards that direction. There are other environmental toxins that can trigger autoimmune disease as well. Let's say mold is another very common example. And, and people typically with mold exposure will initially look like they have allergic disease for a period of time, right? So that's A to P, which is TH2 dominant. Uh, just for all the viewers, if you're not an immune expert, this is very advanced stuff, but TH1 and TH2 are subtypes of CD4 helper cells, T cells, probably the most, uh, one of the most important white blood cells that we have in our body. So they'll look TH2 dominant initially, and if they're exposed long enough, mold creates very immunosuppressive toxins, their entire immune system will plummet. You'll see no B cells, you'll see no T cells. The only thing that you'll see active for them is an elevated CD8, which is a T suppressor cell. And they'll have an inverted CD4 to CD8 ratio, um, basically, you know, meaning that their immune system is trying to attack something and at the same time is too wiped out to be able to do so. So on this idea of immunotyping, and there's 12 different immunotypes, and the other concept is that part of it is that if you work with the right practitioner, they can help you get from the immunotype that you are to, I don't want to say correct immunotype, but a more balanced immunotype Yeah, that's there. And what's really exciting, and, and you know that wasn't really the focus of it, but because we brought up immunotyping, I want to mention it, that your father has actually developed a test around this. Yes. And- how would people get access to the test and and what could they hope to find out about themselves if they were able to take this test? Yeah, uh, I think it's actually one of his most brilliant um, ideas to date. And I say that, you know, with a tremendous amount of respect for what he's done um, because it's been incredible. But uh, first we have to talk about the tools that we've had as clinicians available to us to try to determine someone's immunotype or understand the specifics of their immune system to date. And we have to talk about why those don't really help us as much as they should. And then we'll talk about the, the differences with this new generation of tests that my dad's um, created and, and what it should be used for. So essentially, if I tried to understand someone's immune system right now, I would do you know, uh, some basic cell counts, which would give me some understanding of how many B cells, which are antibody producing cells do they have? How many of a broad type of T cell do they have? And I would get some very general loose idea of what's happening with their immune system. And is that along the ideas of, you know, you want to make sure there's enough, but if there's a lot, that could be an indication that there's a war. It's kind of like being in a plane yeah. and flying over a war-torn town and seeing, okay, there's hundreds of thousands of soldiers out. There's some active conflict that's going on. You get level of function. You get amount of imbalance. You get some really good kind of general scope. I think your analogy is perfect. You're 20,000 feet in the air and you're looking down at, at the, the war scene and is there destruction or is there not destruction basically, right? And th there's some use in doing that. In fact, I've been doing that regularly for a couple of years in my practice and, and you know, it does give you some more information, but you really can't get a very good sense of how prone somebody is to autoimmunity or let's say on the other end, allergic disease or um, TH17 dominance is a big part of central nervous system autoimmune disease. So, you know, though you get that 20,000 foot view, you're really not up close and personal with the immune system itself. And one of the ways that people have tried to be able to do that is by looking at chemical signals called cytokines to say, okay, well, you know, we know that Th1 T cells produce something called IFN gamma, interferon gamma. So let's look at how much interferon gamma there is in the blood, and then we'll know if this person has Th1. The problem with that is that cytokines are not cell specific, meaning it's not just a Th1 cell that will produce a cytokine. Many other cells will too, including something called a CD8. So people have been trying to figure this out, sometimes hanging their hat on it. And 
I, I think, doing it inappropriately. So that's because the tools haven't been around to be able to really say, okay, what exact kind of immune cell is here? How much of it is here? How much of it is there in relationship to the other kinds? And then you also have to have somebody interpret that data for you because it really takes a very skilled immunologist to be able to give you those nuances. So first you need the test, then you need the interpretation. And my dad with Cyrex, he's the chief scientific officer for Cyrex Labs, has created that in that test by the time you know we air will be available. So you'll be able to basically say with specific tagging of clones of T cells, how much of it is Th1, how much of it is Th2, what's the balance there, and get an immunotype actually given to you. And from that information, you then say, okay, now I can like really, I've got a microscope on the immune, I've got a GPS tracker on the immune system, right? Like I, it's, it's two, it's 15 degrees this way. I need to move it neutral, right? And and the reason for that is because a balanced immune system is one in which autoimmunity is much much less likely. So we want to find imbalance and move towards balance, like everything with the universe. Absolutely. And now, just to for context, because people all over the you know. The, the world are watching this and listening to this. This is not a test that anybody's going to be able to get to their regular traditional doctor yet. Maybe one day, but really the reason that you have to go to a functional, you know, a trained and integrative physician is because it's not just about the test. It's about the interpretation and then deciding what to do next. Yeah. So I believe Cyrix has a database on their website of doctors and things like that and, you know, can help you find somebody in your area. Often, sometimes people go to the IFM website. Yep. You know, your clinic is here in, you know, Los Angeles and, mm -hmm. you know, people can Google around. But it really takes having somebody who has the expertise to be able to understand it and then understands what lifestyle, environmental, viral, you know, bacterial, gut, all the different factors that play into creating that and, and what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the lab has some responsibility also to try to educate somebody on how to use a new toolkit like that. So my dad has actually gone through tremendous effort to create a system where the lab result itself will give you a humongous amount of useful information. And then there's going to be in an, there's an interpretive guide that comes with it to give you the details if you're interested but you know essentially the lab will spit out hey this is this person's immunotype and then you can intervene and we were speaking about you know predictive antibodies for somebody who is on the path to autoimmunity those are really wonderful as a initial screening tool but when you want to have some security that the thing that you as a clinician is working to intervene upon that person. You don't want to look at the antibodies themselves because they can lag for quite a period of time behind your success with the immune system. So immunotyping would be that way to say, you know what, this person was TH1 dominant. I've intervened, I've pulled them off of this, this and this, or they had this infection and you know we've cleared the infection and guess what? Now they're TH1, TH2 neutral. And you'll see that three months later, which will probably precede the drop in antibodies by maybe six months or more. So you'll you'll know that you've had clinical success way earlier than if you just looked at the antibodies again. And that's just the nature of antibody production. They can persist for a long period of time. Yeah, it's almost like if we knew that certain people were more likely, which we do, to ultimately develop with certain types of cancers, and then you could have a screening test that could find, because we all have cancer cells in our body, yep. every one of us, even if we're healthy, but our body can keep it mitigated yep. can keep it at a place but if we had a test that was so sensitive that it could catch it early which there are different people and companies working on it mm -hmm. no one that i think that is f fully i think there was at one point in time a test called the oncoblot test yep. um i don't know where it is right now i don't think that people can order it for cancer but i know that we ordered it for my mom mm -hmm. um um in, in part of like her cancer journey after she was treated um but if you could catch it and you were in you know you know, you were in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, you were earlier before you were diagnosed. Mm -hmm. I mean, how helpful that would that be? That would be extremely helpful. Extremely helpful. So part of the work that's going on behind the scenes is that, you know, you do need a doctor to run this test, right? A doctor has to order it. They have yes. to, you know, get this test for you. So it's not something that we as consumers can just do. 
But behind the scenes, I think that Cyrex, your dad, you, you guys are doing a lot of education to say like, if there are open-minded doctors that are listening, clinicians that are out there, not just MDs, but it could be, you know, other, other clinicians that are there, you know, come on board, get the training, understand why these tests work, you know, sign up with Cyrex or whoever else so that you can start to understand how to interpret these. And it's another tool in the toolbox of helping your patients who are dealing with autoimmune or are worried that they're on the pathway towards that. And I'll, I'll really quickly mention that there are also physicians who are not functional or integrative trained these days that are getting on board with this. And I want to give them- Which is exciting. Very exciting. Um, you know, here in LA, uh, I'll often work with rheumatologists and uh, Attune Health, which is a branch of Cedar sinai run by an incredibly brilliant rheumatologist, Swami Ventrapali, uh, has, I, I think, started to see and understand that there are additional things that we need to learn to be as successful as we can be with autoimmune diseases. And now they are ordering Cyrex testing and Genova testing and other things for their patients over there and, and will collaborate with me and others um, in, in their care. So I, I think that the you word know, is getting out. The word is getting out. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with somebody going to their neurologist and rheumatologist and just saying, hey, listen, would you be open to running this panel for me? I think it can help me with my you know, autoimmune condition. And, and the physician might say, hey, I, I won't be great at maybe interpreting this for you. But you can say, yeah, the lab will, will do that for you. The lab will provide resources. And ultimately, it's a benefit not just to that person, patient who's advocating for themselves, but also to the physician who will learn an incredibly valuable skill set after they've done one, two, or three of those tests and then can execute it and help their patients further. Yeah. And I think the best way to go about it is, you know, don't go in and demand it, no. right? Because, you know, you want to be kind yes. and cordial and everything like that. And listen, everybody has egos, but sometimes doctors have the biggest ego. It's okay. Yes. But everybody has egos. I know that more than most people, for sure. And so go in kindly and you know share a little bit and and talk about a little bit of it put yeah. some put some pieces together i think there's some fact sheets and stuff and say you know in an open minded way you know it seems like this could be something that's valuable yeah. nothing wrong with asking nothing wrong with asking and also at the cleveland clinic you know where yes. uh, dr mark hyman is yes they uh you know they order a lot of cyrix labs and stuff and th one of their first studies that they published there was on uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I believe mm -hmm. it was. Yes. And, uh, and autoimmune there. And, and the difference between um, traditional intervention, traditional standard of care versus the functional route and showing the differences. And that was published in, in JAMA. We'll link to it in the show notes. Um, very exciting. Um, now, testing and, and going through a practitioner and immunotyping, which is a, is a part of this, that is going to be accessible to some. It's not going to be accessible to all. Mm -hmm. So let's now talk about practical things that everybody can start thinking about, whether they have an autoimmune condition or whether they're worried that they might be on their way. So let's even start on a base level. When you are doing patient education, when you're talking to people that are out there because you give lectures and stuff, or you're doing podcasts or YouTube videos, when somebody is thinking, you know, am I on my way to getting an autoimmune disease and how would I even know? What are some stuff that are widely available that a test that they can get from their doctor or just symptoms or things that they might be going through that could be an indication that something is going on and there's a battle happening internally. Yeah, there, there are really readily available <clears throat> basic screening tests that any physician can order and most physicians will be more than happy to if you come to them and say, listen, I'm, I'm experiencing these vague symptoms. I'm concerned that there's something happening with my immune system. You don't necessarily have to say autoimmune disease because you, you I think, trigger uh, an idea in the head that may be difficult to entirely uh, understand for the physician, you know, because autoimmune diseases are very, very detailed and challenged and they go to different subspecialties. So let's say you're going to your primary care doc and you're like, I've got joint pain something's up with my brain. My memory is going. I'm too young for this. Um, I just don't feel right. You know, can we check on my immune system? And an anti-nuclear antigen, a rheumatoid factor, and basic just white blood cell count, looking at whether your white blood cell counts are normal, and then basic inflammatory markers, which is a, a ESR, erythrocyte, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and a CRP, C-reactive protein. Believe it or not, with that basic set, you can get a yes, no, that 
for the majority of people out there will give you some semblance of whether something is happening with the immune system in a negative way and kind of confirm for you that, hey, I've got to find somebody to join my team to continue this investigation. Or, you know, maybe I should continue reading wonderful resources from Mark and other people out there that teach people the basics of executing anti-inflammatory lifestyles that can therefore start combating what's happening with the immune system at that point. So now let's talk to the people who have a diagnosis already, right? They, they've walked away with one of the type of diagnoses that are out there. How many total autoimmune conditions are there? Like uh, More than 70. It's growing every day. Yeah. I mean, you know, like the, there's some argument that Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are autoimmune diseases at this point. And a strong argument, actually. If you're going to use a monoclonal antibody against a protein um, produced by an immune defense in the brain for Alzheimer's, I think it's a pretty strong case for it being some type of autoimmune condition. So 70 plus diagnosable conditions that are yes. out there, diseases that are in the category of autoimmune, you know, take us through, you know, you walked us through the original buckets in the beginning that were the primary vehicles for creating the conditions. Yeah. Um, and it's not just that it's going to be one of them. It's usually a combination of yep. them that are going to create the root causes and conditions for autoimmune to express itself at a level where especially it has a diagnosis. You know, we're talking, this podcast is really about two parts. It's catching it early, mm -hmm. maybe before it has a name mm -hmm. so that you don't end up in a position, which was your story, yep. you know, knock on wood that there's people that are out there that are listening that can do that. And then there's also, okay, you have a diagnosis. What do we want to be looking at? So let's go through some of these pillars. And I'd like to revisit again food one more time before we go on to the next ones. And in, in the book that's out, you know, or that's coming out shortly when food bites back, what are some of the key principles we talked about intestinal permeability. Mm -hmm. We talked about how food actually connects into it. And we talked about the two biggest culprits, at least right now, with them being you know, dairy and people reacting to the casein protein that's inside of there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know, the gluten protein, which is going to be inside of, inside of wheat, mm -hmm. right? So we, we have those. What are other things that you want to tell people about food, both things that can be harming them and things that can be helpful in the process of recovery. I think the most important thing to take home from this is that it it should it, it should be a little bit of a precise decision what lifestyle intervention you should execute. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be something decided by testing. We know enough about specific autoimmune conditions to know the common triggers for each individual autoimmune disease. So something you'll see in the book is that we go over large autoimmune categories by organ system. And at the end of the chapter, we'll say, hey, if you're suffering from rheumatoid arthritis, these are the common trigger foods, right? Gluten, lectins, dairy, corn, right? And, and the reason for it is covered in the first portion of the book, why specific categories of foods, gluten, lectins, corn, dairy, you know, food additives, gums, everything under the sun, salt, why, why they specifically trigger autoimmune conditions. And then each chapter subsequent is the brain chapter, the thyroid chapter, the bone chapter, the gut chapter, et cetera. And each one has a specific set of foods that should be eliminated if that is the condition that the person is suffering from based on mapping the different similar peptides between the autoimmune target and the foods themselves. And, and this is all the accumulation, I think, of 40 years worth of work that my dad has done in this space and me applying it clinically every day in the practice and saying, we've got to get this out there for people. Let's do an example. You yeah. know, first of all, that's incredible. I haven't seen the book yet but I can't wait to dive into it. Yep. And that's an incredible resource. And please, if you're listening and you're dealing with autoimmune, like you got to go out there and, and get it. And we have the link inside of the show notes, but let's give, uh, let's give an example. So let's use something like rheumatoid arthritis, yep. right? And, you know, you were mentioning a few of them. You talk about gluten, which we've talked about before lectins, yep. some, you know, a lot of Dr. Gundry's work, who's been on the podcast before, he's kind of been the lectin guy that yep. a lot of people know of. Yep. Some would argue sensationally, some would argue not sensationally enough. But, you know, tell us, like, how is it that, just a reminder, what are lectins, but how could that be related to, I don't know if that was an actual example that you were giving with rheumatoid arthritis or if you were just making that up, but how could lectins be connected to, uh, you know, a particular autoimmune disease more than another? Yeah. So... 
to answer the question first of is it too sensational or not enough, the answer again is it needs to be a personal decision. Lectins are problematic for some autoimmune conditions and some people and not problematic for other autoimmune conditions and people. Rheumatoid arthritis is a very good example in which lectins are often problematic. The reason for that is very straightforward. In research that my dad did, he found that the reason lectins are an issue is because they cause something called agglutination, which means that proteins will stick to each other. They'll, they'll allow different proteins to stick to each other, specifically antibodies. They'll, they'll form complexes where they will just bind to each other. And in rheumatoid arthritis, one of the big antibodies is something called rheumatoid factor, which is in fact an agglutination of two of our own antibodies circulating in the blood and sticking to the joints, right? That's literally what a rheumatoid factor is. So if you're consuming a food that causes agglutination, you are going to increase the amount of rheumatoid factor you produce because you're allowing an environment that allows antibodies to stick to each other. By removing the agglutinin food category, you are reducing the body's desire to have antibodies stick to each other and therefore reducing symptoms and the propensity for rheumatoid arthritis. It's very specific, right? So the foods that create agglutination, gluten is number one. That's why it's gluten, right? Uh, soybeans contain something called soybean agglutinin in them. So soy is number two. Beans, so black beans, brown beans, uh, lima beans, pinto beans, that's number three on the list, right? So we've covered three foods. Um, some of them specifically in the lectin family, but we're talking about the ones that have the most dramatic impact on rheumatoid arthritis itself in order. And then you move down the list of lectin foods, which have the least, you keep going as to how commonly they create agglutination. So it's true that the lectin group is this huge group that does have foods in it that are very commonly problematic for people with rheumatoid arthritis. The truth is also more specific than that. There are foods in that list that cause more problems than others. And typically the way we go about it is you say, start with gluten, move on to soy, then beans, see how you're doing. If you need to go further, then, you know, then you'd go down the rabbit hole of a lectin-free diet, you know, no cucumbers, no tomatoes, no peppers, you know, you, you keep on going in that list. But um, th there's specific um, characteristics of foods that cross-react with autoimmunity and you need to understand those things when you're telling somebody to follow a diet. So that's what I really tried to do in the book. You know, and this is the beauty of functional medicine. And again, you and your dad have been a big part of sort of establishing what those interactions are. And it's all about personalization. So when somebody says that it's all about lectins and then somebody says, you know, we had, um, and, th and these, all these people are my friends and I know them and I love the different conversations yeah. and the debates that are there, but like a lot of things, it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And in personalized medicine, it's always what's related to that person that's there. For sure. I've actually known way before I even knew what a lectin was that I was very sensitive to a lot of the foods that are in the family of being higher amounts of lectins that mm -hmm. are there. Yeah. Nightshades. Yeah. I, I knew that I would eat a bowl of tomato soup and my entire face would turn red. Yeah. I'd have almost this sort of like um, inflammatory response. I didn't know what it was. I just knew that it happened. That was there. And, you know, we've had people... Um, very incredibly, you know, strong individuals that like Dr. William Lee, who's been on the podcast from the Angiogenesis Foundation, mm -hmm. brilliant guy, eat to beat disease. You know, his part that he's been bringing out there is that, look, I think a lot of what's out there with lectins is overblown mm -hmm. and our body actually even makes lectins. I don't know enough about that mm -hmm. to really comment on it, but I've heard him say it. And then there's other people that are like, it's all about lectins. And then there's people like yourself that in the middle are saying, look, if you have an autoimmune condition, this might be an area, especially if you have particular types of autoimmune condition that you have to pay attention to a little bit more. And the beautiful thing is you could do like a challenge. Absolutely. You could try to see. And in some cases you can test, you can actually test for it. Yeah. I mean, that's where you get into the space of having somebody who knows how to interpret the testing for you, which should always be, I think, a prerequisite you know, doing these tests at home on your own is probably not a great idea. But let's say you've got a, a skilled person who knows how to interpret food sensitivity testing. You can actually identify what specific things that are covered by the broad spectrum of inflammatory foods are actually unique to you as a problem. And then more importantly, take the specific immune 
issues that that person is facing and look for the the crossover between the two it's not right to just remove every food that somebody is sensitive to from their diet you need to do it with purpose and the purpose should be the uniqueness of their autoimmune or immune condition um, so th that can be true for let's say all the different things in the lectins you may find somebody with rheumatoid arthritis has a problem with tomatoes cucumber and eggplant and soybeans and gluten but they don't have an issue with you know lentils they don't have an issue with you know uh, navy beans right so that's a very very long list of things to try to trial and eliminate sometimes you can get away with it um, and sometimes you can't and so that's why testing exists for some people you know going back to the idea when food bites back we've been primarily talking about foods in uh i'm just going to use this as a general term that negatively sort of impact the body because yeah. of how they've been changed maybe in some cases genetically modified, mm -hmm. which by the way, part of genetic modification, the way that it works is to actually maybe increase the natural lectins mm -hmm. that are in certain foods to as then- defense mechanism. Pest defense mechanism. So some of those foods that again, weren't as problematic mm -hmm. are more problematic because mm -hmm. they're designed to literally make the stomachs of insects explode. Yes. Well, they're gonna probably do something to us. They're yes. not gonna have no effect that's there. Yeah. And there's some people that do well with these foods just like we were talking about the difference between me and you, mm -hmm. there's some people that can eat certain things again or can have limited amounts. So there's some people gonna have tons of it and it's all based on our, on our history. What about foods that are actually deeply healing, especially when it comes to autoimmune and particularly foods that don't often get the credit that they deserve in our sort of mainstream standardized American diet. What have you seen as themes over the years? Are there a few that you could call out that really you want to give the attention and spotlight on? It's actually very challenging to find themes or groups of things that people commonly consume that helps them um, because there's so much of a personal tendency to react negatively to things. But the things that I've seen, um, I think that people who follow very clean, plant-focused, maybe with Mediterranean-leaning style diets do the best, right? Um, I, th I think that that's an incredible challenge because you've got to do an anti-inflammatory version of it. But let's say you're having large amounts of crucifers and greens and it, you're eating organic and there's a lot of avocado and olive oil and you happen to find, you know, some fair caught, clean seafood products to consume every once in a while. Maybe throw a mussel in there, uh, you know, as Dr. Gundry suggests. Um, they tend to do incredibly well, I think, in the long run. The problem with that is that's a very difficult execution, I think, for most people. So what tends to work as an algorithm is, okay, show me what you're eating. Let me pull the bad stuff out and let me tell you good stuff to replace it with, right? So in, in my world, the things that I've seen that really help as far as replacements for the majority of people are fiber products. Talk a little bit more about that. You know, most people think of fiber as sort of the classic brand cereals mm -hmm. that are there and Metamucil and other things like that. But what type of fiber are you talking about and how is that supportive in the process of autoimmune? So I think that it's, it's actually fiber plus uh, omegas if you can deliver them together. Mm, interesting. Are a tremendous beneficial soup for the bacteria going back to one of our earlier points in our conversation was it's all about the intestinal micro environment, which is a very complicated thing. But if you can put fertilizer in for that three to five pound biomass that lives inside of us, overall, your intestinal micro environment will be better. The fertilizer is clean fibers and omegas. So I think the best way to get that is a blend of organic psyllium, some chia seeds, and some ground flax, all of it organic. And are you imagining this goes into a smoothie? How are you imagining somebody taking I put taking mine it? in the smoothie, but okay. uh, but there's another Dr. Bojdani out there who does it in a different way. So I'll give I'll give you uh, the the seniors version of it. He will actually make a cereal out of it. Okay. He'll put in some uh, clean almond milk. Uh huh. He'll put a, a tablespoon of each one of those three. Let it congeal until it kind of turns into an overnight oat gelatinous style thing. Gelatinous, and that's his breakfast. And um, He's 76 and looks like he's 60, so I think it's working for him. That's great. <laughs> any, any way that is comfortable for you is an okay way to do it. Yeah, and so the psyllium husk, you know, 
as people are looking at like fiber options and then they're looking at also now that we're having the blood sugar conversation, yep. which we've been big, you know, totally. Dr. Hyman is, you know, wrote sort of like one of the big sort of magnum opus sort of books on it, the blood yep. sugar solution. Um, when people are looking at the best fibers, uh, you know, so psyllium is there. What other ones are our favorites? Do you like acacia fiber? Do you like, you know, any of the resistant starches that are out there as, as, as fibers? Actually, for me to be able to tolerate a fiber is a very big deal. And and when we're talking about gut environments that are not necessarily in the best place, at least in my demographic because of the autoimmune disease, there's a lot of propensity for people to not tolerate some of those more advanced fibers like sun fiber, um, acacia fiber, inulin, right? Um, Jerusalem artichoke fibers, though, though on paper, if I were to pick, those need to be in there. The problem is not everybody can tolerate not them. Not everybody so can handle it. I think psyllium, flax, and chia are a good combination of soluble and solubles, uh, soluble and insolubles, and they uh, flax and chia carry omegas with them specifically. So I think that it's a good foundation. But if somebody can handle some uh, Jerusalem artichoke fiber, more power to them. Now this is where it gets really interesting, and that naturally, you know, because we've all moved from where we grew up from, mm -hmm. and food was just kind of like you see what's out there and you eat it, right? Yep. Now we're sort of dealing with control uh, environment it's grown in. Is it helpful? Did our ancestry and our gut microbiome grow up eating that? So in the case of chias, again, I don't know the details on this, but I've heard that they can be high in lectins. Yeah, and not everybody tolerates them. That's true. Great. So that's where we just need to add in a little bit of sophistication. Yes. Right, so it's not that we want to go crazy for the sake of going crazy, but we're putting in our own personalized layers depending on what we're dealing with, and part of that is just you know you got to roll up your sleeves and listen to some podcasts, dig in. You have a ton of YouTube videos that are out there, yeah. still many of them that are very relevant, even if they're four or five years old. Conversations mm -hmm. with you and your father, we'll link to those as well. The book, reading it and trying it, because again, what's the alternative? Suffering with this condition for the rest of your life? Yep. Right. That is, you know, unfortunately what so many people are doing, it's bankrupting them. Bankruptcy for medical bills is one of the highest is the number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States. Yep. You know, we don't have universal health care over here. It's affecting their mental health. So many people that go through autoimmune conditions are much more likely to develop other mental health um, conditions mm -hmm. uh, in cases, some cases, full blown diseases. So. There, there. This does take work, and maybe one day we'll have a smart computer that can figure it all for you and tell you exactly what to do, and maybe even spit out a pill, pill or a meal that you can consume Jetson style. We're not there yet, so there is legwork that needs to be done. You're absolutely right. You have to. Th this movement began, I think, from a human perspective as a counter movement to the increasing illness and chronic suffering that we unfortunately go through these days, right? So part of our evolution is to continue to understand next levels about ourselves. People fortunately, like Dr. Hyman and others, give out material for us to learn from collective experience. And absolutely, you need to educate yourself with these new generations of information in combating what's happening to us make changes to the way that you're living and see how you feel. When I went back and although I had the fortune of testing with my dad, it wasn't until I removed the gluten and dairy and I felt like a different person that I was really, you know, convinced that that I kind of understood how by making some change to my lifestyle, I am changing myself and my life. So that's what everyone needs to do. Do you feel and feel free to say no, right? That's why I'm asking you. So I'm just trying to set up the question. Do you feel that people identifying their unique toxic triggers, right? They're, especially because we eat two to three times a day, mm -hmm. right? Do you feel that people identifying for an, somebody that's diagnosed today with an autoimmune condition is looking for the next step that they can take? Do you feel that one of the lowest hanging fruits is ident lowest lowest hanging fruits that they can immediately start to see some benefit from, right? Everybody's personalized and people need to figure out what that, you know, combination of interventions is for them. But is one of the lowest hanging fruit fruits for them figuring out which foods are the ones to remove? Absolutely. It, it, it's could that be more important than even what foods to add? Yes. Absolutely. It's not only the lowest hanging fruit, it's probably the biggest one too, right? It's the one that will yield the most for that individual. Finding out your trigger foods 
which means the things that are causing the most direct dysfunction in that intestinal microenvironment and removing them even without replacing anything is the most potent thing that anybody with autoimmunity can do. Uh, it, it may not take you 100% of the way, but it certainly takes the majority of people a huge percent of the way there. It's a big leap forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, it's not going to be everything. And you actually see a lot of people who have done even extremely restrictive diets, and then they need to look at a different bucket. Right. Right. What would you say, again, broad strokes here, right? We have to kind of work a little bit in broad strokes, even though everybody's a little bit personalized. So if that is one of the lowest hanging fruits, what would be one of the next ones. I want to give like two more and you can switch buckets. You can go from food to environmental toxins or chemical exposures or other stuff. What would you say is the next biggest bucket? Very clearly to me, it's chronic viral infections, right? I, you know, I think um, the chronic infection category is a huge, huge realm. Um, though we talk a lot about food and gut health, it's, it's, you know, I think a very, very important one and likely one that we will continue to understand and consider going forward given Again, everything that happened in the last year, um, but chronic viral infections, specifically Epstein-Barr virus and HHV6 as triggers of autoimmunity are very uh, important next steps. Um, so th those are things that we as human beings are all commonly exposed to, but if, if you happen to be exposed to it at a time where your immune system can't take you to completion, you, you're running this marathon with the virus and you want to win and the virus just edges you out right at the end, it's going to stick around a little bit. And um, the immune system will continue to try to get that last leg in, but will not succeed. And it's in that attempt of continuing and continuing and continuing and continuing where immune issues occur and autoimmunity occurs. You know, an, an area that I want to really acknowledge you for, and we were chit-chatting a little bit before we started recording, you know, there's some big, big personalities that often get very well known for introducing a very specific concept into the market. You know, we talked about Dr. Gundry and his viewpoint on lectins mm -hmm. and everything. And again, Dr. Gundry's a friend, really appreciate, you know, stuff that he's done out there. And then I understand where criticisms come. And, you know, that's why we have a podcast and open dialogue is we're trying to meet somewhere to help people navigate and understand all the nuances because it's really about the nuances. Another individual that's been in the space that I'm also connected to, and I would also consider, you know, a friend. We've had l more limited interactions, but um, some really pivotal ones is the gentleman medical medium, mm -hmm. who's not a medical doctor, is is not a, a licensed healthcare healthcare practitioner. But yeah. I get asked about him all the time anytime we talk about autoimmune because yep. his work is so pervasive, yep. and he's helped very notable individuals, some of who we've introduced him to, and he's helped them and they really swear by his approach. Yeah. And in the context of autoimmune, one of the main things that he talks about, he'll say that primarily, if I could just big picture share, he says, you know, this idea, uh, the idea that your body is turning against itself is, is kind of in his words, maybe bogus. You know, it's not that your body's turning it away from itself. It's that you have been hijacked by viruses. And I think the thing is, you know, he has his whole vision around it. He says that he's tapped into a deeper spiritual dimension that's influencing his work. Okay, great. You guys are in the science field and you're going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. He sort of says that eventually people will figure out that and the testing will catch up. Maybe that's true. But I think the common thread that's there, because at least it seems that some people following his programs are getting better. Yeah. Some people are not, just right. like anything that's out there, mm -hmm. is that... You know, it's not just, you know, uh, molecular mimicry, which is this idea that our body is turning on itself because certain proteins look very similar to certain cells in the body. It's also that viruses can play a role into it. So how is it that viruses are a vehicle for it? Is it that they're just damaging and it's through the process of inflammation that they're breaking down that barrier? Or is there something else going on out there? Um, so in, in the chronic viral setting... They're both possibilities, right? So either the cell itself will take up residence in a part of the body that's very crucial to the immune chain. For example, with Epstein-Barr virus, it has a tendency to dor uh, remain dormant in B cells, which are antibody-producing cells. And that, that's kind of its evolutionary hijacking of us to stay within us alive um, and also handcuff our ability to fully clear it. Uh, if it does that, then it alters the way that B cells really are intended to act, right? So they can't clear the virus. They're maybe producing antibodies differently because they're inhabited by a virus that they're not supposed to be inhabited with. And they can actually instill autoimmunity directly by being present within a cell. Uh, another virus that does 
something similar in the brain in a chronic inflammatory autoimmune sense would be herpes simplex virus in the world of Alzheimer's disease, right? The way that that happens is that the, the virus actually will penetrate into the brain and the amyloid is initially created to aggregate around it as defense mechanism, but it continues to aggregate and continues to aggregate because it can't really fully clear it, right? So, which, you, which, which, by the way, just to interject, I found this mind blowing when I was watching one of your presentations and mm -hmm. conversations with your dad. You guys were talking about how we know for a fact now that if people have certain, you know, STD, sexually transmitted diseases, mm -hmm. they're more likely to develop Alzheimer's in the future. And Absolutely. I thought that was incredible. And just another reminder for tends to be, you know, we talk about young people, especially to get your STD screens to really look at these viral infections that might be there that have that that could have come. And they're part of your wellness journey of trying to make sure that they're treated, addressed, and at least mitigated so that they're not constantly expressing themselves and make you more likely for some chronic condition later on. Exactly. If your body feels like it has to continuously clear a virus that you were exposed to, like herpes simplex virus, for 40 years, it's going to cause damage along the way. It needs to fully sense that it's gotten rid of that virus, that it's done with that war, that it's not creating more immune cells to deal with something because it, it it's the unintended consequence of the immune system that damages and destroys the surrounding area, right? So it needs to win that war as soon as possible, ideally immediately after the initial infection. But if you're having an issue 15 years later and you catch it, then it's better than 30 years later. Absolutely. So, so really just another idea of, and, and this is not even to throw on the lens of human beings and viruses co-evolved together. Mm -hmm. A huge percentage of our DNA, what we used to call our junk DNA, yep. is actually the the integration of sort of, uh, is is the appropriate term viral DNA? Is it viral RNA? What, what would be depends the- Depends on the, the virus. Depends on the virus. Yeah. So we have co-evolved. So it seems that there is some sort of symbiotic relationship, just the way that we thought about bacteria before is it's bad. So let's just nuke it with a Z pack or antibiotics. Mm -hmm. There does seem to be that viruses were an important part in our evolution as a human species. Absolutely. Uh, uh, bacteria, viruses, yeast, um, we live ideally in harmony with all of them. And our immune system, I think, primarily is designed to maintain harmony when the immune system loses a little bit of its ability to do that because of chemical exposures, food sensitivities, whatever along the way, stress of living in modern society, that's where symbiosis turns into dysbiosis or an imbalance. Um, so it's really important to create balance again. And, and there are viruses that are notorious for being able to walk to the other side and cause issues. And there's probably other organisms that we haven't identified yet that do something similar too. You know, we're, we're, we're in this continuous flux with our environment and we need to maintain neutrality or balance there. And just like we had the history of overprescribing antibiotics, it seems to be that we still might be in a little bit of a history current modern day history of trying to get completely rid of some of these viruses yeah. when really the the conversation becomes, and this is what you and your dad have been big proponents of, is that is it to get rid of this virus completely, which might be very tough depending on somebody's age and how long this has been going on, or is it to build back up and maybe change the immunotype so that this virus, which is still there, is not able to wreak the havoc that it can do. Absolutely. Let's take Epstein-Barr virus again. Everyone's, you know, I think kind of a uh, most understood example of a chronic virus. The way that that natural course should exist is we're exposed to that virus at some point, right? Either you get a cold or you get mono or you feel nothing. What should happen is the virus ends up in a dormant phase, meaning it's living quietly, not replicating somewhere in the body. Let's say it's a B cell, let's say it's thyroid tissue, let's say it's a lymph node. Still showing up on a test often? It can show up on an antibody test as prior okay. exposure, but it's Got not it. expressing the proteins involved in replication. It's okay. not replicating. Got it. Right. So to the immune system, it's no burden. It, it's completed its... its uh, its job, it pushed into dormancy, and that virus will no longer be an issue if all things with the immune system remain intact going forward. The problem occurs, again, when we lose something in our immune system, 
Epstein-Barr virus reawakens, it enters a so-called reactivated state, it begins replicating and hijacking the B cell or the thyroid cell or lymph node tissue, and that's where it ends up becoming a future issue and can propagate autoimmune disease or other issues going forward. So it, it's all about, yes, our body is intended to interact with these things. Did we interact with them appropriately? And did the virus go to the place that it was supposed to go to based on our activity at that point? And did it stay there? So you mentioned viruses, just zooming out, as like the second big bucket that there's an opportunity for. Now, this is one area that I'll even tell you that a lot of even, you know, well-intentioned functional medicine doctors don't have a, the biggest amount of education on it. It's growing. Mm -hmm. It's definitely growing. Mm -hmm. So how does somebody who's listening that's saying, okay, I get the foods and the food triggers and sort of navigating that. I'm going to pick up your book when food bites back and sort of look at my conditions and what I'm dealing with and see if I can find some patterns. Maybe do a test, like a challenge test, like an elimination diet to mm -hmm. remove certain things and see if I get better. In viruses, how do they navigate that, right? Do they have to go to their doctor and ask for a particular test? Uh, is there stuff that they can be thinking about? How do you recommend to people who may right now not have the ability, you know, if you have the ability to come see you, I don't know what your wait list is like or anything like that, please, you know, if, come fly out, come to LA, you know, book an appointment with you and your clinic. We have the link in the show notes or any of the doctors that, you know, you might also recommend that are in this area. But how does somebody have to think about viruses? I don't think we're at the point yet where someone can navigate that space very well on their own with, with resources because our understanding of it is very early compared to where we are with gut health and food health. And I, I'm hoping that that changes a lot. You know, part of the success with the medical medium is quite frankly, a lot of that work that's recommended at the end of that book is not really viral work, right? I mean, there's dietary change and there's detox work and, you know, maybe the message to get to it follows a viral path. But if you look at the interventions themselves, there really isn't any, you know, strong direct antiviral work that's being done. Then I think it's kind of hitting on the foundations of functional, functional medicine, but just with a different message to get there. So, you know, I think to me, fine, you know, if somebody's doing something healthy for themselves at the end of it, no big deal. Right. Um, with viruses, it's, it's very challenging. You have to understand the specific virus. And there are so many out there that an ability to map everything is challenging, but if you understand the immune system itself and where it may have a kink in its armor against viruses, you can then build those up. So if you're gonna do that precisely, it takes testing. Now, are there things that people can do every single day to make sure that they walk around with full metal armor and they don't have to worry about a kink developing at some point in the future? I think that's where the power is, right? Like be, be proactive about the way that you live your life. and what happened with COVID last year, and, and you know, people keep on appropriately saying this is a learning lesson for us going forward, but it's a learning lesson for the immune system. People who were walking around with a kink in their armor and they didn't know it got their butts kicked, right? And that should be a message to all of us to make sure that we have full armor on all the time. Eat an anti-inflammatory diet, eat plenty of antioxidants, Get some sleep, you know, do your best. You know, I've got two kids at home. I have a, at the time of this recording, a four day old, you know, it can be challenging for sure at times, but it's something you want to try to prioritize. Um, all the basics make a huge basics. difference. Exercise, you know, like th there was a, a brilliant paper that came out in nature a couple of months ago that showed that regular weight bearing exercise changes the clones of immune cells that come out of your bone marrow for the better. You will better defend yourself against viruses. So, and actually in the world of specifically fighting viral infections, we know that people who get sleep deprived or people who uh, don't exercise do incredibly poor with viral defense compared to people who do. And that can change in as quick as 24 hours. So um, there are basic things that we just need to look down and, and, and just say, hey, what am I doing? What am I prioritizing? What do I want for myself in the future? And just make shifts. And this is not something that somebody has to be perfect at tomorrow. This should be part of the never ending journey of improving oneself in life. It's well said. Perfect antidote to that. And, you know, while we're wrapping up here to make sure you get home to your newborn baby and your wife and everything. Congratulations, by the way. 
you know, my brother-in-law is one of the healthiest people I know. He's a cardiologist based down in uh, San Diego. He works at Kaiser. He's been going through all his functional medicine training and everything. Very, uh, very open-minded physician and um, would hardly ever get sick and, and was working with COVID patients all the time. And this was prior to any kind of, you know, vaccines or anything else that was, you know, going on and being developed. This is last year in the thick of it, surge mm -hmm. in California and other places. Wasn't, you know, no, didn't get COVID, you know, was there day in and day out with patients, patients up close and personal in a very close environment, not able to social distance because he's a doctor and mm -hmm. other things. And his mom, who had been sick for years, you know, bless her soul, she um, was nearing the end of a uh, battle with, uh, uh, you know, a couple chronic diseases that were there. And um, a fall, unfortunately, that happened, and he flew out to the East Coast to be with her. And this was um, um, just earlier this year. And in, you know, I don't know if he took a red eye that night, but he wasn't sleeping, went in the hospital, he's by her bedside. On top of that, deep emotional stress because it's your mom. You know, you're so sad. It's a parent. You're there. You're trying to take care of them. You're trying to advocate on their behalf because you're also a doctor, trying to make sure they're best care. And, um, you know, your diet isn't the same. And even though he had gone this entire, you know, year of, of close proximity to so many people who had COVID and other things like that, didn't have anything. And on the flight back home, started developing, you know, symptoms, landed and immediately, you know, went to go get tested and everything like that and found out that he tested positive for COVID. Mm -hmm. So even the healthy of us that are out there, whether it's COVID or other things that are there that we're dealing with in our life, if our immune system has that kink in the armor now something else can take over. Absolutely. And it's an important reminder because as long as we keep on doing the work, it keeps on working. And that takes time and be gentle. It's a marathon. It's not a race. Mm -hmm. You know, fill yourself with positive information, education, have a positive attitude and mindset, be hopeful and find out as many examples that are out there to show you what's actually possible so you can make a difference. And on that note, Dr. Virjani, I just want to thank you for really breaking this complex disease, diseases and conditions down in a way that is so understandable and giving people hope that there's a different way to go about their autoimmune condition. I respect you and I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. It's my pleasure and honor. Thank you for having me. The book is out there, When Food Bites Back. Find it in the show notes. And if people want to reach out to your clinic, What's the name and how can they be in touch with you? The name of the clinic is Regenera Medical. Uh, it's in, in uh, Brentwood, uh, part of Los Angeles. And uh, just regeneramedical.com is the website. Uh, I'm not the only practitioner there. I do supervise everybody who's working there. So uh, if you uh, have an opportunity to, to come to my side of the clinic, fantastic. If not, I am supervising and looking over everything that's happening there as well. And the test that your father as the Chief Science Officer? Chief Scientific Officer. Chief Scientific Officer of Cyrex. Could you spell Cyrex just so everybody knows? Yeah, yeah. It's C-Y-R-E-X, Cyrex Labs. They're based in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I think the website is CyrexLabs.com. The name of the test is Advanced Lymphocyte Map. Advanced Lymphocyte Map. And that basically helps them with their immunotyping. Exactly. So they can dig in. And Cyrex has a bunch of different tests. I'm not affiliated with them. I know a lot of the people there, including your dad. Mm -hmm. I think I think the CEO is still Jean, Jean Ballon. Yep. Yep. Who was a friend of mine I've known through a long period of time. No formal relationship, but an incredible resource. And they have a lot of different testing that's out there and available. But again, you do need a practitioner. And they can kind of help you find and navigate and and find somebody there. Thank you. Hey, YouTube, you're going to love this interview with Terry Walls, who talks about her battle with MS and how she recovered from the debilitating symptoms with the power of food as medicine. Your lifestyle is your disease modifying therapy. If you stop it, expect a rebound. Just like if you stop your potent disease modifying 